that. I am, my name is uh, Dr. Howard Coons. I am the director of the Center for International Defense Policy. I want to thank you all for being here today uh, and uh, welcome you to this iteration of our International Defense Policy Lunchtime Speaker Series. I'd like to introduce our speaker of the day, Dr. Ian Garner. Ian's research focuses on Russian culture and propaganda of war. He completed his PhD in the Slavic department at the University of Toronto after graduating from the University of Prisca, which is in the United Kingdom, <laughs> and St. Petersburg Conservative, Conservatory, which is in Russia. His first book, Stalingrad Lives, Stories of Combat and Survival, explored the nascence and afterlife of the myth of Stalingrad as a propaganda tool, both historically and under the current Russian regime. His most recent work, Z Generation, Into the Heart of Russia's Fascist Youth. And I will just, I have a copy here. I would just say it's available on Amazon for a very reasonable price. So that way Ian doesn't have to say it. <laughs> <laughs> This book, this most recent book, has charted the experiences burgeoning neo-fascist youth militarism since the year 2000, leading into and contributing to the conflict in Russia, or sorry, in Ukraine. Ian has written for media outlets and makes regular appearances on global TV and radio networks. He has worked with think tanks and policymakers in the UK, Canada, USA, Ukraine, and across Eastern Europe, and currently teaches in the Department of Political Studies at Queen's University. So I'd like you all to help me welcome Ian here today. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. And thanks for a nice introduction, which surveyed my career very nicely. Um, all right. So I am going to begin by showing you a video from everybody's favorite social media network, TikTok, which, if you don't know, is currently the most popular social media network amongst young Russians. Probably not a surprise. And if I click next, it's only 20 seconds long. So this is a video filmed in the regional city of Tver last year, and it went viral on Victory Day, the celebration of the end of World War II, that is the Putin regime's biggest national holiday. It goes on a bit as well, so don't mind the video. It keeps going much the same. And these figures, the young lady here wearing the outfit is involved with a patriotic paramilitary youth group called the Youth Army, which is a state-sponsored group. I'm going to be talking more about them later. And the group exists with the stated intention of driving young Russians into joining the armed forces once they hit the age, age of 18. And the reason I think this video is so interesting, and sums up a lot of what I discuss in the book, is that we tend, in the West, to have a very polarized view of what young Russians might be and how they present themselves and what the state wants from them as well. Either we think that young Russians have no interest in the war, no interest in the regime, and are desperate to flee abroad, spend all their time using VPNs to access forbidden Western news networks online. Or we tend to think of all young Russians as sort of, you know, slavish, drum-beating, incredibly militarized, incredibly angry, aggressive, genocidal kinds of kinds of young people. But the reality is actually, at least in the way that the state wants it to be, much closer to this. And that is, the state is trying to produce a world in which participating in rituals like Victory Day, wearing the costumes of Russian militarism, will lead into joining the army. But dressed up too in the aesthetic forms and using the communication networks that are very familiar to us in the West. And this looks like a million proposal videos that you might see from the West on TikTok. Really, the only difference is the fact that these figures happen to be wearing military uniform. You'd agree. And yet this went, this went viral. 
And it's a real video. This is not staged. This is not something that the state produced. I looked into this. I did a lot of slightly creepy cyber stalking. This is a real, real relationship. And this guy just came back from the front from Ukraine. And he proposes to his girlfriend, who is 19 or 20 here. She's actually graduated from the youth army and has become a sort of detachment leader in the group. And so in the book, I wanted to figure out what's going on with this sort of identity. Why do Russians buy into this sort of identity? How many do? And how is the government trying to sell this sort of identity to young Russians today? So here is the book. Um, I am very, in terms of my scholarship, interested in performativity, in political subjectivities. Um, I take a very interdisciplinary approach. I'm quite happy hopping from history to cultural studies to politics and back again. And to do the research, as well as doing a sort of ethnographic survey of TikTok networks, various social media groups, principally on VK, which is the Russian, more or less, state-owned um, Facebook equivalent. I also conducted interviews with about 60 people who are either young Russians or who are involved with educating or what we'll say, what we'll call ideologizing young Russians. And the interviews that I describe in the book, the stories, the case studies are roughly split between people who are on board to varying degrees with the state's projects and those who feel marginalized, excluded. So ethnic minorities, in particular, the queer population in Russia, which I'll come back to very shortly, is um, very much marginalized right now. And the thing that I really want to draw people's attention to is in the West, we see a lot of coverage of school textbooks. Right, That seems to be a big deal in news stories and in, and in academic study. But actually, the Russian state is conducting most of its work outside of schools online using digital campaigns, using influences, and using digital techniques. So I'm going to rip you through in the next 20, 25 minutes or so, about 23, well, let's say 23 minutes, 23 years of, uh, of Putin's rule. How perfect that I rambled for so long. Now, you notice I use this term fascism in the title of the book. We don't have the time right now for me to talk exactly about what Russian fascism is and looks like. Um, although we can talk about, about it at the end if anyone wants to dive into that in some uh, in some more detail. I don't think that the early Putin era was fascist by any means. However, I do think that there were sort of fascist urgings, let's call them, even in the earliest, earliest years of the regime. And you can look, for example, to Putin's very first speech when he came to power, 31st of December 1999. He makes the big New Year's Eve speech from Moscow, which is a bit like the Queen's speech. Well, does the Queen's speech mean anything to Canadians? Yeah, you know, this is a Christmas Day Queen's speech, you know. Does Justin Trudeau do one? Oh, no one's even sure. That's, uh, that's Canadian politics for you. <laughs> sorry for any Canadianists. Sorry, Jonathan. <laughs> In that speech, Putin talks about the start of a new era, and he uses this, this word, skazka. A new fairy tale time, a fairy tale era is going to begin. And that's interesting because he's immediately signaling that what we're aiming for is something mythical, something utopian, something that inherently can't be real. And I don't have more time to delve into it now, but isn't it interesting that at the same time, and this is really central to fascism, Putin is waging a very vicious war. Indeed, the first thing that he does when he comes into power late in 1999 is begin an incredibly violent war against Chechnya, which is technically a part of the Russian Federation and Chechens are spoken of as being Russians. And in this early year in the 2000s, in terms of youth politics, we do see nationalization and an emphasis on nationalism in the school curriculum, for example. And generally, in terms of popular culture and youth culture, young Russians are allowed to do more or less anything they want. You can be a good Russian in the state's conception and in official political terms. And 
be, for example, queer. You can be an ethnic minority. But I just want to show you, this is a mostly state-funded film that came out 2007, 2008. It was a big hit. It's a musical. They revive old nostalgic films, uh, old nostalgic songs from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And here is the main character, Mills. And he's trying to be a Stiliagi, be one of these hipsters. And at the end of the movie, his friend comes back from New York and tells him, there are no Stiliagi in New York. Your dreams of being American, of being liberal, of what it means to be a jazz fan are all fake, really. Stay in Moscow. And this is the closing credits. What you see is Mel's and his love interest, who are, of course, united very harmoniously, very perfectly, walking down one of the major prospects in Moscow. And you can see representatives from the different subcultures that have existed in Moscow in the present and the recent past. There, are some, there were some goths, some sort of skaters, hip hoppy type people. You can see where my vocabulary begins to uh, draw to a bit of a close. And the message here in this huge smash hit film is that yes, go play with being American, play at being dressed up however you want, but in the end, you'll come back to Moscow. You'll come back to being Russian. And look at here we all are living this dream reality. And in a sense, this looks a little like that TikTok video that we just saw, right? The very happy, harmonious end. And so one of the characters that I interviewed in the book is this guy, Ilya. And he's an artist from Moscow. And he spoke to me about coming out in Moscow in the 2000s, growing up feeling very isolated in the 1990s, and then seeing the opportunities that are available to him as a young person. And he felt like he was a Russian. He felt patriotic at the time, but he could also go to gay bars. He also saw gay icons on television, including Ukrainian gay icons who are no longer welcome on Russian television. Just a little irony for you there. And the point that I want to make is before 2012, mostly the state was pretty hands off when it come, came to young Russians. However, on the peripheries, if you chose to participate, you could join groups like Walking Together. Nashi is the famous one. Nashi is the one that probably most people will know. Nashi means ours. Very patriotically loaded word there. And football hooligan groups that were sponsored by the state and were essentially part of a program to disrupt liberalization, to disrupt this pluralization of identity, this pluralization of opportunity. And they went out, for example, these hooligan groups went out on Hitler's birthday and would beat up gays in Moscow, happening in the 2000s. But this was a minority, and Nashi was never a big movement. It was a sort of pet project of somebody in the Kremlin, and it died off within a few years, mostly due to sort of internecine Kremlin battles around power. It was never intended to be a major project. The turning point happens, though, in about 2011, 2012, what scholars have termed the patriotic shift. And this is a period when Putin is challenged on several levels by the Arab Spring that is unfolding. And he's looking at this and thinking, well, this could happen here. By the global financial crisis, which means the opportunities that have been afforded <clears throat> to middle class Russians in the 2000s in terms of growing incomes, travel abroad, being able to get your hands on nice new gadgets, education abroad, those begin to dry up a little bit. There are murmurings, frustration, and lo and behold, protests do start. And this is where this guy, Alexei Navalny, and his former press secretary, Anna Viduta, who I interviewed for the book, and who's a very interesting figure, this is where they make their move. And there are massive protests in Moscow, and Putin is paranoid. Putin is genuinely spooked by this, genuinely afraid that this is going to lead, you know, this is a Pandora's box. So he attempts to slam the door shut. And this is a period that will lead, as I'll show you, to figures like Ilya, that young gay man, 
talking instead of being at ease with myself. Within years, Ilya's telling me I found myself fighting myself. I found myself forced to fight an internal battle where I could no longer be Russian and gay. It was an impossibility for me. And so around about the 2012 presidential election, Putin begins to announce a series of much harder nationalistic policies. And I want to draw your attention to just one speech that he made the following year in fall 2013 at the Valdai Club, which is the least fun club you can imagine. It's basically a Kremlin-sponsored policy mill. It's, it's designed to look like a sort of a real think tank type organization, but it's most definitely not. And Putin often attends and makes a speech in their major fall meeting. And the speech they made in 2013, the backdrop to the screen says, Russia's diversity for the modern world. And Putin talks about the evils that are coming from abroad and influencing young Russians, political correctness, pedophilia, homosexuality, feminism, militarism, and even Satanism. All words he mentions, those are not synonyms that I'm choosing, those are his actual words. Russia's young, he explained, were under attack, and only a spiritual revolution, enacted through a policy of cultural therapy, could save them. And in response to this speech, cultural politicians, cultural activists, went out and formulated a new, new, a new youth policy that was based around a very restrictive set of values. Gone was pluralism, and in place was a series of identity pathways that essentially suggest the only way to be a good Russian, the only way to participate in community, is to transform yourself into an ideal Russian, based around nationalistic values, highly masculine values, so-called traditional family values, i.e. official homophobia, and the Orthodox Church at least the Russian Orthodox Church, which is not what you would think of as a regular Orthodox Church. And in the book, I, there are some, I don't have time to go into them now, but some very strange reports that come out of the Valdai Club at this point that are riven through with racism and homophobia. And this is the point when you start to see the first official anti-LGBTQ laws enshrined in federal law in Russia, when propagandizing um, homosexuality to or non-traditional family values, whatever that might mean, then the gray area is quite deliberate. This is when this becomes a crime, if you propagandize this to, to young Russians. But it is not just about the stick, right? It is also about the carrot. And the state also began at this time working, for example, with cultural producers like Embrace Yourselves, because this is going to be the, one of the worst songs you've ever heard, Timothy. And Timothy is a very successful Russian rapper who is something like Russia's Jay-Z. He owns a burger chain, clothing line. Sorry, Rebecca, you know what's coming. <laughs> He produces songs for like dozens of rappers that are in his stable. And it all looks like Western content. So Black Star is his, is his label, Black Star Mafia. And this is a song that he produced with a guy called Sasha Chess, who sort of produced, you know, pulled out from nowhere, produced one or two songs, and then disappeared again. The song, Moy Lodshi Droget President Putin, My Best Friend is President Putin. Imagine if Jay-Z is singing this about Trump, right? High production values. You know, this is not sort of shoddily made state propaganda. It's not quite my cup of tea. But the point of this material is that Putin shows up as a youth icon. We see, or we start to see, as we go through this song, Nationalistic Colors, it's filmed on Red Square. We see the Basil's Cathedral in the background. As we go on further, I'm going to stop this in a second so you don't have to get this far. But we see a guy dressed as Putin 
entering a nightclub and all the you know scantily clad ladies gather around him and sort of worship him and the point is this music is incredibly popular in russia i'll stop it so it just goes away this music is incredibly popular in russia in the mid-2010s this is not some sort of fringe activity this is drawing the language of nationalism the language of exclusivity into popular culture in a way that many young Russians just don't conceive of as being equivalent to actually actively supporting the state. And when I spoke to some of the folks who are more nationalistically inclined, shall we say, for the research, but not full on sort of drum beating pro-war activists, they said, yeah, sure, I listened to, listened to Timothy back then. I don't like him anymore because it's a bit old. But no, that doesn't make me a crazy Putin supporter. I just enjoyed it. So it gives us almost this sort of ability to be somewhat ironically distant while also engaging with and performing the language of nationalism. And you also see it in online culture at this point. This really begins to take off. And here is something that happens after the invasion of Crimea. So there is this, this lady was appointed to a high-ranking judicial position in Crimea. She's the chief prosecutor of Crimea. She is a Russian after the invasion, Natalia Poklonska. And she's getting a lot of blowback from interviewers who are saying, you're too young, you're just a sort of silly woman. It's really sort of patronizing stuff from the Russian media. You shouldn't be in charge of this. And she basically tells them to F off by saying, no, nyash, nyash, something, something. And nyash, nyash is a sort of, silly nonsense internet phrase it doesn't mean anything and this goes viral and it's rhymed with this phrase krim nash which is basically the government's official slogan krim nash crimea's ours right pretty blunt slogan and nyash miash is turned into a Viral song, Nyash Nyash Krim Nash. I'm definitely not going to play that one for you because it's too bad. It's auto tuned, sort of internet culture by a guy called Enjoykin, who was a very famous Russian YouTuber with millions and millions of followers. And Nyash Nyash Krim Nash products are still for sale now. You can buy these, but you don't have to subscribe to the United Russia Party. You don't have to go and join an institution to take part in this kind of nationalism. So here we have, you know, map of Crimea plastered with the Russian flag. And here we have anime version, again, online culture, the anime version of Pokolonskaya and Nyash Myash Krim Nash. She's got in quite a lot of trouble lately, actually, because she's been a bit skeptical about the invasion of uh, Ukraine in 2022. And thus we get to the point where the state pushes harder and harder around the militarization of youth identity in particular. And that really begins in 2016 with the founding of the youth army, which is the brainchild of Sergei Shoigu, the defense minister, or at least publicly it's announced that he's brainchild. I'm not sure that Shoigu has had many bright ideas in his life, but he gets the credit for it. And it is attached to the defense ministry. And this is basically Cub Scouts with guns. It is not simply a revival of the Soviet pioneers. Children are given real military training as well as ideological training. They attend history classes, but they also take part in on, online activities. And for the first two or three years, the state really struggled to make the youth army take off. Uptake was okay. They had about 300,000 members by late 2018. It's not bad for a new organization, but it is on a, not a mass organization at that point. And it had been led by a couple of different people, all of whom were bland, gray, slightly boring Soviet bureaucrats, not inspiring and not engaging for young Russians. So in 2018, 2019, the state starts to adopt a much different strategy. And they appoint this guy, Nikita Nagorny, in 2019 as the leader of the youth army. Does anyone know who, who Nagorny is? No gymnastics fans in the room? Nope, fair enough. So Nagorny is an Olympic gold medal winning gymnast. 
national hero, world champion, you know, hugely successful athlete. And you can see him here. Who's he with on the left there? Any hockey fans? This is Ovechkin. Thank you. This is Alexander Ovechkin, the, cap the uh, Washington Capitals hockey. Is he still on the hockey captain? Yeah, there you are. So Russian national, big supporter of Putin. And the Gordon isn't just photogenic and young and enthusiastic. He's also a social media influencer. He has between 750,000 and a million followers on each of Instagram, VK, and TikTok. And his feed is basically him living a digital influencer lifestyle. It's mostly him doing workout videos, sharing tips on how to become stronger, how to become fitter. He dresses in the national dress constantly in his sports outfit, talks about coming home to Russia after he's been abroad, less so now because he doesn't get to travel to that many places these days, and he's sanctioned by the European Union. And from time to time, yes, he'll meet Ovechkin, but then he'll post a video of him wearing the Youth Army uniform and spreading the messages of the Youth Army. And what we find here is in the comment threads, something that is quite novel in the way that authoritarian, totalitarian, fascist, whatever you want to call states like Russia, are able to engage with young people. And that is, if in the past we had this, or they had the problem of behind closed doors, the closed kitchen door beyond which the state struggles to reach, well, nowadays, constantly, kids go home, they turn on their smartphones. And in their smartphones, even if they're not a member of the youth army, although there are now 1.6 million members of the youth army and they are struggling to keep up with demand, the numbers are continuing to accelerate. Even if they're not a member, even if they're not following these groups, their friends are liking their friends are sharing, their friends are commenting, and thus they see this interaction with the state constantly. And even better for the state, not only can Nagorny be this sort of, you know, idol, the role model of what it is to be the perfect Russian, white, masculine, physically strong, you can even get him to talk to you. And from time to time, Nagorny will respond to his followers. Not very often, but they can engage in a meaningful participation online. And some of the people I spoke to, and there, there are a range of parallel groups and parallel figures, but some of the young people I spoke to talked about how exciting it was to feel like they were part of a community online, part of a group. And what I thought was very interesting was the fact that some of those young people we're in very far-flung and remote Russian towns and villages where 20 years ago, there was no Nashi to join there. There was no meaningful community to be built there because it was just too irrelevant. But now anyone anywhere can touch this kind of glamour and can essentially participate in a political rally 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that's a very meaningful distinction, and it's something the state understands. And so while our eyes are very much on what's happening in Russian schools and classes, we need to turn our attention away from that and look at the way that the state is engaging people online to understand where this militarization might be successful in the future. And I just want to show you that children are participating in it meaningfully. So here is a video that a couple of teens uploaded at a youth army sort of gathering, viral, you know, viral dance. And it, apparently Russian kids have been doing this dance. I, I don't know what it is and I, I haven't seen it anywhere else. But they spontaneously decided to do it. This is uploaded to their personal accounts. And yet at the same time, pop music. This is how you put together a gun. And there are lots of very, very similar videos. I did not have to go hunting for these. And I actually have written a, another article analyzing very closely some TikTok sort of 
communities and found that around 25% of the videos have actually showed some form of sort of highly militarized or violent content in this regard. So what the state promises is belonging through joining in its military projects. And here is another, this guy is a sort of young military, uh, youth army influencer from the Russian regions. And you can see here, he's just doing normal team stuff. Most of his videos are about the homework that he's doing. What's going on day to day, silly practical jokes. But a lot of the time he's simply wearing his youth army uniform. This is the creeping militarization, as Cynthia Enlow calls it, of day-to-day -day life, such that we don't notice it unless we study these kind of signs and symbols. And so what the state is promising is not just belonging. It's promising through war and destruction, joining the military. And we can talk more about this kind of counterpoint of destruction and regeneration if you're interested. This is not a war about the past. This is not a war about bringing the Soviet Union back when we're thinking about Ukraine. This is a war that promises a future, a future of belonging, a future of, of racial purity, a future of national strength, but also a future of individual popularity, a future of everybody as an influencer and everybody is successful. So I'll, I'll stop there. Because um, I could talk all day. Thanks so much, Ian. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm going. I have the privilege of moderating. Uh, we are using this mic now. This is not for you folks in the room. It's for the people who are coming in virtually. So when you ask your question, I'll make sure you have the mic and it's turned on, and we can go from there. So who would like to start off? Well, thank you for scaring the shit out of me. <laughs> um, I, that a lot. I started your book and uh, I got into the third chapter and frankly it, it frightened me I'll probably go back to it at some point here's the thing that keeps me awake at night the prospect of a post-Putin meltdown and the emergence of warlords across what is Russia with nuclear weapons and millions of youth militarized into this culture and a forever kind of Haiti on a continental scale. Mm -hmm. Can you speculate on the prospect of that? <laughs> All right, let me put forward then the optimistic scenario, because <laughs> it's still only lunchtime. I mean, there is some really good evidence for what you're suggesting. And if you're interested in this, this sort of breakdown, then Alexander Etkins has released a new book, Russia Against Modernity, which I think Alexander and I don't see eye to eye on a lot of things, but it's a really good book and you should you should have a look at it. And he talks about this kind of breakdown actually leading to a, a more positive future through the lens of climate change in particular and environmentalism. Um, I think it is hard to see for me the idea that warlords are going to take control of Russia. I just I just don't see a large scale breakdown of the Russian Federation happening. Um, let's say Putin dies tomorrow. And you should read the conclusion to my book as well, which is positive until the last page, and then it's very negative again. Um, <laughs> let's say Putin dies tomorrow. Who takes charge? Well, it's probably worse. I don't think there are many worse people who could take charge in Russia. I mean, yes, there are, but you know, it's not going to be a Ramzan Kadyrov. It's not probably going to be a military leader. I can't see a military coup happening. You know, somebody like Mizinsev, who is the so-called butcher of Mariupol, has been banded about as a potential leader of a military coup at some point. I just can't see it happening. He doesn't have any interest in politics. He really is a kleptocrat. You know, he's out to embezzle and get what he can. What's much more likely to happen is that somebody who is Putin adjacent steps into power. And by that, I mean, maybe somebody like Patrushev, who is one of Putin's longtime BFFs. They're very close, who has links to security agencies. And they will use those links to a particular group to ensure stability within the country, because 
collapse in Russia really means mutually assured destruction for everybody. And I can't see any of the people in power allowing that to happen. And I think you saw that play out last year with Prigozhin. Nobody, nobody actually followed Prigozhin and nobody even sympathized with Prigozhin publicly very much, except to say after the fact, well, what a wonderful patriot he was. And he was just too enthusiastically patriotic for his own good, which is the way that these billion villains are usually written off in the public spectacle that is the Russian media. The army didn't rebel, not even any military units, individual soldiers. You didn't see the, the FSB rebelling. Nobody in Moscow rebelled. So there was a lot of noise about it, but there was no sign of collapse at all. And we've seen multiple small protests happen, moderate small protests in Moscow on the outbreak of the war. That was stamped out very quickly. Um, we saw a protest just a couple of days ago in Bashkortostan, which is a fairly remote region in the south of Russia that is not an ethnic Russian-dominated region, stamped out quickly, and, and those protests seem to have died already, almost as fast as they began. So I, I don't think we need to worry too much. Of course, it's something that we should be mindful of, but I, I just can't see it happening. Hope you're right. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Anyone else? Sorry. Uh, thanks for that, Ian. Um, this has been a really uh, great demonstration of the support for Putin, but I wondered if in your research you found any evidence for the uh, narrative, and if so, what that looked like. I think in, in the question, you've actually highlighted the problem that the opposition if you can call it an opposition faces. And that is, what is the counter narrative? Is there a counter narrative and how can there be a counter narrative? And one of the things I describe at length in the book is the way in which particularly after this patriotic shift, the state has gone to great lengths to tar anything that is outside of this very narrow box of being Russian masculine traditional Christian as being equivalently non-Russian and therefore equivalently deleterious and equivalently damaging. And so, for example, if you look at the politics of Navalny, which is actually, I think, quite an appealing alternative, theoretically speaking, for the Russian public, because he's a liberal with soft nationalist leanings. And I think that's probably a package that you could sell to, to Russians as an alternative. But the problem is Navalny has been tarred as a Democrat because he believes in democracy, and he says he is. Well, democracy is associated with the West. The West is satanic, it's pedophilic, it's Jewish, it's Nazi. All of these things are just, they don't go together, right? It doesn't make any sense, but they're evil. And thus we found, I found one of the more interesting people I spoke to was a, was a young teacher who's an ethnic Korean, and there is a sizable ethnic Korean minority in, in Russia, in particular in the Far East. And she's a teacher at a music school in Moscow, and came to Moscow and basically sort of discovered anti-Putinism when she was in, in music college. And she said, well, I went out on day one of the war and I protested, but over time I've just fallen silent because I don't know what to say. I don't know what to talk about. I don't know where to go. There is no harmony. There is no collectivity in what any opposition group is offering in the way that the state is offering this, albeit sort of, you know, varnished. It's almost sort of a socialist realist version of reality. And so if an effective opposition wants to actually challenge Putin, they will need to find a narrative that can't be written away as being non-Russian. Now, how you do that, I don't know. I don't have the answer. It seems immensely challenging to me. Does that make, does that yeah, make sense? I actually meant among the, the youth subculture that you highlighted, uh, you'd think that there'd be a, a greater tendency to push back a little bit, but maybe that's just me looking at it with Western lens. And I was surprised by the fact that I just couldn't find any sizable 
groupings or networks beyond Navalny, beyond obviously Western influence groups. There is a guy, Ilya Panamaryov, who's sort of been knocking around Russian politics for a while and is very, very nakedly pushed from the outside. And I'm not quite sure where his his money and his funding comes from. But it's it's pretty transparent stuff. But you do, I mean, you do see lots of willingness to engage and interest in engaging. My worry is though that a lot of those who are engaging in that way are from the slightly older generation Z to millennial contingent. And the kids who are coming of age since 2012 who don't remember a time without this dynamic in Russia, how will they be thinking in the next 10 years? And of course, a lot depends on what happens in the war, what happens with official politics, what happens with the economy. And I'm not an economist, so don't ask me too many questions about it. I have one online question from Samuel Russell. Hello, Ian. Thank you for this fascinating presentation. I am interested if you know if there has been any counterattacks made via social media made by youth influencers in Ukraine or other countries. Essentially, I am wondering if Russian youth have access to media outside of the Russian echo chamber. And if so, what strategies do you think could be most effective to help youth get other perspectives and information. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Good good question, Sam. I want to thank you for joining us and listening online. Um, so yes, there are substantial efforts being made. And let me give you a particular example of one of the more effective models that I think we've seen. There is um, a group of diaspora Russians who are working. They're mostly based in Central and Eastern Europe, who've been going into pro-war Telegram and VK groups and essentially staging little scripted morality plays. And they work like this. One of the group will look at a news story or a post that, you know, is all rah, rah, rah. we love the war, we hate Ukrainians. And they will say, no, go to hell, I hate Putin. And then somebody else from the group We'll produce the scripted response, you know, go F yourself, you, you know, Western Nazi or whatever. And slowly, bit by bit, these two interlocutors will have a conversation where the nationalist ends up not being completely transformed, but having a sort of moderate to mild awakening, saying, huh, I guess I might reconsider some of my beliefs. And in the conclusion to my book, I talk about some similar projects and similar approaches and how they might work. And we know that they've worked quite well with extremist groups like, for example, Al-Qaeda supporters and Islamic State supporters in the past. The thing that I think we put too much store in or too much public store in is fact checking. And fact checking has the awful problem of getting the knee jerk backfire effect of challenging my prior beliefs too strongly, telling, even if you're not telling me I'm wrong, even if you're doing it quite a soft way, you may accidentally reinforce the beliefs that somebody had, and therefore you end up not doing much good at all. So I'd like to see more of this sort of mass showing alternatives, reintroducing pluralization, reintroducing identity pathways into the discussion, unless just trying to push a particular message. And I think that could work. And it, and it, theoretically speaking, it should be easy to do it en masse, in particular in the days of bots and, you know, chat GBT, AI, you should be able to produce a hundred variations in this conversation and, and distribute them online into different groups very, very rapidly. So, and I, I know that some governments are doing that. And in particular, Ukraine is very interested in similar projects. Uh, thank you for again. I wonder if you could speak more about both the regional and the racialized dimensions of this new movement. Because one of the things that struck me in many of your examples of these influencers, they're from they're not from Moscow or Petersburg, they're from the provinces. 
Um, so it, is there a regional, is there regional differentiation? And then the other part, the racialized part, you mentioned that, um, but didn't address it uh, as uh, directly. One of the things that's striking, obviously, about mobilization, many of the people being mobilized to serve in the army are not ethnically Russian. They're often Muslim. They're from smaller regions. Um, they are being mobilized. They're being asked to serve. Are they being incorporated? Youth in those groups being incorporated into this? What is the kind of message? Um, is there a message of inclusion uh, for these groups? Um, and where do you see this sort of racism? So in terms of the geographical aspect, very simply, yes, you're right. There is a very deliberate policy of targeting the regions rather than Moscow and St. Petersburg. However, there is an exciting sequel to the youth army. I don't know if you've seen this, Rebecca, that's been launched. And that is the so-called Divizhenia Pyrvich, the movement of the first, which is being explicitly marketed as the new Soviet pioneers. I, the ideological aspect of the training, but a little bit less scary for Moscow parents who don't want their kids running around with guns and joining the army. So this is a little bit of a softer version. And it is interesting, there is pretty good, I think, survey data from Russia suggesting that a huge majority of Soviets in their sort of mid thirties to early fifties are nostalgic about the Soviet pioneers. Did I just call them Soviets? not Russians. Well, there you are. <laughs> so, um, in terms of the racialized aspects, there is just a, a glaring contradiction in all of this. And like much of this sort of extreme right wing philosophy, if you can even call it philosophy, it is riven through with contradictions. It doesn't stand up to any real academic scrutiny. And the way that the state is dealing with this is attempting to say that we are not multicultural, we are a multinational country. And in educational programming and in events to do with the youth army and in online, for example, viral videos that are produced, there is always care shown to include ethnic minority faces, but consistently it is the white ethnic Russians who take the lead. So for example, there was a video that I can think of produced for a group called the Victory Volunteers, which is another mass group dedicated to preserving the memory of World War II, which of course is being forgotten and corrupted by the West. And they had some, it was some event to do with Victory Day. And the video was about a minute long and it showed people dressed in national dress across the Russian Federation, speaking in their native language, saying, you know, I remember the war and I remember the sacrifices our grandfathers made. So speaking the language of the state, the language that the state would use to talk about the past. But the video ends with all of these people coming together into another sort of mass parade with two very clearly ethnically Russian, a boy and a girl, blonde haired, blue eyed, waving a Russian national flag dressed in a sort of white costume, marching down the center of the shop. So they take the lead. And you see it in youth army marketing materials. There was, a, there was a marketing campaign a couple of months ago in which they did sort of short interviews with people who joined, 30 seconds, a minute long, something like that, about how much they love the youth army, pretty standard marketing fare. And one of the interesting videos that I saw was a video filmed by um, a girl from Uzbekistan, or who was originally from Uzbekistan, who was, I think, 17 or 18. And she said, I came to Moscow when I was 10, and I felt really excluded, and I was bullied because I didn't speak Russian and I didn't fit in. Now, if this was a video made in the West, you would expect that the next part of the story would be the bullies learned the error of their ways, and they changed to accommodate me. You can see where I'm going with this, right? But then I learned to speak Russian. Then I joined the youth army. Now I feel great and I love my country and I love Moscow. And she's doing this speaking perfect, unaccented Russian. And of course, wearing that crisp, nice youth army uniform. And symbolically, she's transformed into being a Russian, even though she's not, even though it's impossible. So, but highly contradictory, right? Difficult to deal with. And I 
don't imagine that this this sort of marketing is going to solve the problems. I uh, I just wanted to, earlier to ask a little bit more clarification about uh, on your uh, not this comment but on the the, the previous question. Um, you had said that fact checking is um, and even is useless or other. can be even counterproductive. Um, I was wondering a little more about the alternative of what type of conversation is more effective and uh, and how not to kind of like cross over that line and get into fact checking uh, just a little bit more specificity perhaps or uh, yeah. So the approach, and I, I talk about this in the conclusion of the book, sorry to spoil it for you. Um, the approach that I would take is to map out, and we can do this using big, big data techniques. And again, it's not theoretically complicated. I haven't done it in the book because it's you know beyond, beyond the scope of the project that I was trying to undertake. You can map out the identity pathways that somebody uses to construct their identity. So I've already mentioned one repeatedly and that is i identify myself as being russian to be russian means to be x y and z means to be christian straight and for example violent i support war you might say that an alternative pathway is you change the last step of that pathway well i don't associate russianness with being militaristic with violence and you might say i don't associate russianness with being christian and you can use data to figure out exactly the ways that people are talking about themselves and discussing themselves, in particular on social media, and therefore figure out what do they mean when they talk about Russianness. And likewise, you can think about what the state means when it talks about Russianness in this, in this mass way. And what we find is that the state continually repeats the same identity pathway, or at least a very, very narrow series of pathways as being desirable. So what you need to do is massively publicize desirable versions, desirable alternatives. So for example, you might show a member of the youth army who talks about being in the youth army, who talks about loving the country, who talks even about being straight, but then says, but I don't want to go to war, but I'm having doubts about Ukraine. And thus, you can stage these things, but you would also find it easy to find Russians who do agree with those things, right? But I think often when we think about what to do with Russia, we're too maximalistic. We want to go right to the other end of the scale immediately rather than seeing that we need to take tiny steps bit by bit and treat this as a very long-term project because the state has been treating it as a long-term project. That's very helpful, thank you. We have one last question from our online audience. Thank you, Dr. Gardner, for this fascinating lecture. Would you characterize most young Russians who are involved in these youth groups and who post these videos on TikTok as more passive or more active participants in this larger nationalistic project? To what extent do you think these activities show that these youth simply want to conform and be like their peers versus them becoming truly indoctrinated? And that's from Edward. Tchaikovsky. Thank you, Edward, and nice of you to come as well. Um, this is a question that's a really important question. Is it often asked, you know, to what extent do, do Russians really believe in what they're doing? And I actually think we're asking the wrong question. Because it doesn't really matter whether Russians truly believe it or not. And this is the point I keep making in the book. What matters is the way that they behave, the way that they speak about themselves. And we deal with that and we address those issues rather than trying to figure out to what extent something is real or what something is fake. And, you know, I, in the book, I go into a bit of the theory behind it about performativity and about discursive construction of reality and identity. And in particular, the state understands, the Russian state understands that I don't, they don't need people to believe it. They need people to believe that other people believe it. And that's enough. And I think there are two points that I'll end on there. 
firstly, the next few years as artificial intelligence, deep fakes, even quantum computing takes off, it will be harder and harder to resist this sort of propagandizing and this sort of identity construction because you could potentially exist in a social media world in which you are you believe that you are engaging with potentially dozens or hundreds even thousands of real people who look and feel real who are behaving in a particular way none of whom are actually real and when it comes to ukraine the question we should be asking is does it matter what a Russian who pulls the trigger and shoots at a Ukrainian really believes. It matters whether they pull the trigger or not. And that's what the Russian state is interested in. Ian, on behalf of the Center for International Defense Policy, the team here, and plus the gathered audience, which is a full house, first time we've had that in a while, uh, the post-COVID period, plus those online, I'd like to thank you for a really interesting talk. And for me, at least, you've peeled back some of the curtains surrounding nationalism and ideology in, in the Russian diaspora and in Russia itself. And for that, I really thank you because it's helped me kind of understand a little bit better some of the things that are actually going on and why some of the things that are happening right now are actually happening. So on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to thank Reed. Ian, one of our research fellows, I might add, uh, for his presentation today. Thank you.